Uh, in junior high school, I went to the library, and I like to read. I've always got several books going, and there's a series of books called Captain Hornblower. Anybody ever read those books, the Hornblower series? There's a whole series of books about this guy named Captain Hornblower, and I just love it. It's set during the Napoleonic years, sailing ships. I think can build models. I love to make those wooden model ships that take 650 hours to do. I've got these things at home that are really, really beautiful, and I'm going to give them to somebody. What do you want to be in the air? <laughs> That's what we're talking about this morning. I got these beautiful things, and uh, I don't want them to go to somebody doesn't want to take care of them type thing, but it's not, Captain Hornblower is just really a great story. I, I enjoyed it in junior high school. I bought the books. I still do enjoy it, even over after all these years. And they have made movies about this guy. They have re reissued the books over and over again. And uh, I just enjoy it. Anybody recognize him? That's not Captain Hornblower. He played the part. I think it's... Uh, it, that's not Grant. Who is that? Gregory Peck. Uh, Gregory Peck. That's who that is. <clears throat> he played the part of Captain Hornblower. And uh, I really liked it. When uh, Hornblower was young, he becomes a midshipman on a ship. He's 14 years old when he becomes an officer, a junior officer, on one of, the Nepo uh, one of uh, Lord Nelson's ships. And the whole series, it watches him grow from being a midshipman all the way up to being an admiral in the, in the king's fleet. He's courageous. He's genuine. He cares about his men. He likes to appear tough, but really he's got a soft heart. He tries to be fair to the guys that are in his ships and in his armadas. He's level-headed. When there's a crisis situation, he's just able to control himself and to do the right thing. He's humble in his leadership. He accepts blame when he's wrong. It's just a tremendous story. It's just a tremendous story. I recommend it to you. Uh, there's about six books there, and the most famous one is Captain Hornblower. Isn't that a great name? How would you like to be called Hornblower? Want to be a Hornblower, Lauren? <laughs> she blows a trumpet. Just a tremendous story. I've got another good story for you. I had a great dad. I had a great dad. And a couple of wonderful grandfathers. They gave me a whole lot in life. They taught me a whole lot. My dad was a preacher and a fisherman and a mechanic and a musician and a whole bunch of stuff that I just really learned from him and enjoyed. And my grandfather, one of them was an electrician, taught me how to do that. I can replace these bulbs. I know how to change the fixtures. I know how to wire a house. I know how to do it. And I can fix your electric motor if you've got one out there at the farm. I know how to do that. My other grandfather was a plumber, so I can fix the toilet. I know how to fix that stuff around the house. He was a plumber, and he was also a super sheriff. And I know what it means to ride along at night in a small town about like Liston when the bars were closing down. I know what it's like be with my grandfather. He was a uh, gardener. He liked to do that kind of thing. And I'll tell you what, my dad never had time to teach me how to drive. My, my grandpa, you want to drive? Sure, I'll be the bitch in the end, is the way he used to put it. I'll let you drive me all over town. That'd be fine. So grandpa taught me how to drive. All those kinds of things. How to take care of my house how to take care of my wife, how to love my wife, how to take care of my family, how to take care of the finances of my circumstances. And I'm so thankful for what they gave me. I enjoy it and, then, and benefit from it almost every day. And so does my son and so does my wife. They were examples in leadership. They were examples in skill. They were examples in Christ. My grandfather became, on the Bouchard side, became a Christian when he was about 40 years old. Ended up being an elder in the church. Three out of his four children became preachers. 
my dad, after he got out of the Navy, went into Bible college, and then he went into the ministry. And of my siblings, I have four sisters. All four of them are the preachers. So when we get together, we have a great time. They all sing, they all preach, and they're not afraid of people. And it's just fun to be with them. My other grandfather, on the gross side, he became a Christian when he was 72. And I remember the day it happened. I was sitting about halfway back at the church. There was a revival meeting. Grandpa got there. It's kind of a complex story. I'm not going to tell you all that. But he went to church that night to satisfy my mother and some of his grandchildren. And he, when he went forward that night, I couldn't believe it. And Grandpa became a soul winner. He would get underneath the house working on the plumbing and he would talk to people about Jesus. They were examples to me in Christ. There was a guy, though, in the Old Testament that did not have those benefits. His name was Josiah. He had none of the benefits of great-grandparents or parents or whatever making a difference in his life. And in 2 Kings, the 22nd, 23rd chapter, we hear the story of a young man who becomes king of Judah when he is eight. He is eight years old. His grandpa, Manasseh, was notorious. He did all kinds of nasty things. He ruined the country physically and spiritually. He was not a good man. And under his reign, he had to pay tribute to Assyria because he lost the war. He encouraged his people in pagan worship. He taught them how to study and to worship the, astro the stars, astrology and the occult. And he encouraged his people to, to sacrifice their children to Molech and to Baal. He shed the blood of many. That was his grandfather. I don't know what your circumstances are, what kind of inheritance you have, what kind of example you have in front of you, but Josiah has a terrible example in his grandfather. His own dad, Ammon, was so bad that his own staff killed him. <laughs> they assassinated the king of Judah because he was so crummy. And then the people of Jerusalem were so upset with those guys that they killed all the assassins. And so Josiah becomes king of Judah when he's eight, eight years old. Can you imagine that? Without direction, a nation is in chaos. A country is subjected to a foreign power and has to pay tribute. And worst of all, one that had decided not to follow the God of creation. They decided not to do that. But instead, it began to worship wood, a piece of stone, or whatever they could think of. They worshiped rocks that we call stars. And they worshiped their own bodies. And by the time he's 16, it's amazing how he begins to throw off those examples. And he begins to seek after the true God. And by the time he's 20 years old, he's making reforms, he's getting rid of the idols, he's getting rid of the altars. And the people who work there, he gathers money and he begins to restore and renew the temple in Jerusalem and to pay off those who worked there. While cleaning out the temple, you know how the story goes, and removing all of the junk that was around the church. <laughs> you ever been to churches, you know those closets that are around the corner, it's got all kinds of stuff around it, you know, that hasn't been moved for 40 years. When they're cleaning out the temple in Jerusalem, they're going through all the assorted junk. And you know what they find? They find the book of Deuteronomy. A lot of Christians have never even read the book of Deuteronomy. But they find the book of Deuteronomy. And it's the book of the law that's been given by God to his people through Moses. And nobody had read it for years. The people hadn't celebrated the things they were supposed to. They were even unaware that they were supposed to. They were unaware of what they were supposed to. And the reading and the observance of the law had been neglected for decades. 
and even hundreds of years. And when Josiah heard what the book says, the scripture says that they, he tore his clothes in mourning. He wasn't Hulk Hogan celebrating anything. He was mourning the fact that he was sorrowful and even full of grief because of what his nation had come to. And he started a reformation, a restoration, if you will, and he got rid of the pagan priests. He tore down the altars. He even got rid of the pagan sites. He wouldn't allow it to happen. He fired the guys his father had appointed to those positions, and he gathers the people of the country together, and you know what he does? He gets in a pulpit on a wall and thousands of people stand there all day in the heat of the day. Can you imagine that? None of us would go, for sure. And he reads to them the book of Deuteronomy. Can you imagine if I stood up here and read the book of Deuteronomy to you guys? The enthusiasm would be rampant, wouldn't it? <laughs> he reads the book of Deuteronomy to these folks. And when he gets through, he asks them if they would agree to live for the Lord. And you know what? There was enthusiasm. They agreed. They agreed. They reestablished the Passover, and they did it in a magnificent way. A way it hadn't been done for a long, long time. It's kind of like not having Thanksgiving for a hundred years, and all of a sudden somebody says, there's a great idea, let's do it. Worship was reinstituted and people were happy. But the Bible says he was one of the best that you'd ever had, and he ruled for 31 years. He started at 8 to seek the Lord, and he continued in that process the rest of his life. And I want to ask this question How about you? <laughs> How about you? Have you started to seek the word seek and underline? Have you started to seek the Lord? Have you decided and underlined the word decided that you're going to live your life in such a way that it glorifies God? Have you started to seek first His kingdom and His righteousness? Some of you are probably saying that you're just too young. But if you say that as a young person, I don't think you're being genuine because I've heard a lot of young people at our church at least say, I'm old enough to make my own decisions. Some of you are probably saying that you're just too old to change. But the gospel is all about change, you guys. It's all about change. And when it comes to that change, maturity has a lot to do with becoming responsible. Maturity has a whole lot to do with becoming responsible for yourself and for others around you. And that motivation has to come from within. It has to come from inside of you. It can't be motivated from outside because you will not prevail. And nobody can make you do it. Nobody can make you do it. You're never too young or too old to do the right thing. I don't care what your age is. You're never too young or too old to seek after righteousness. You're never too young or too old to tell the truth. You're never too young or too old to take responsibility, to go beyond just the bare minimum and to do what is right. You're never too young or too old to worship and not just play at it. You're never too young or too old to go to worship because you want to, not because somebody makes you or because it's your tradition or your habit or that it's convenient. You're never too old or too young to demonstrate your maturity in learning about God and doing all you can to cause your friends at church to walk with you in that discipleship. 
You're never too young or too old to make good friends. And obviously, Josiah had some friends that were good for him when he became king at eight. You're never too old or too young to make good friends that were a help like those that helped Josiah. And let me ask, how old do you have to be before you worship on your own? How old do you have to be before faith becomes your own? Not grandma and grandpa's. Not mom and dad's. Not your best friend. But yours. How old do you have to be before truth becomes your own? And it motivates you with the way that you live, the way that you talk, the way that you act, the way that you view life. How old or how young do you have to be before you get serious about your behavior? How old do you have to be where you recognize the need for a Savior to come to faith, to accept Christ as your Savior, to be baptized? How old do you have to be? To be faithful to your own belief and decision. Let me ask. We talk about seeking after righteousness. What's that mean? What's that mean? Well, if you define righteousness, basically it's being morally right, if you will, or justifiable, even virtuous, if you will. But the righteousness of God is a whole lot more than that, you guys. It's more than just being good. It's a whole lot more than just being, quote, unquote, It has to do with living a life that glorifies God and is set apart for something special. Josiah tried to do the right thing. When he heard what was missing, it changed him. If I didn't believe people can change their hearts and their minds, I would not be standing here today. What a waste of time if you can't get beyond what you are. He started with himself and he offered leadership to those around him. In Matthew, the fifth chapter, verse, chapter 5, verse 6, Jesus said what? Blessed are those who hunger. Ever been hungry? It motivates you. Blessed are those who are hunger, who hunger and thirst. I wanted that Coca-Cola yesterday afternoon, real bad. Who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Boy, I appreciate that. I had a hope in that Coke being well placed. <laughs> and it was. And my hope in Christ will be fulfilled. Paul says, as we heard in the scripture earlier on today from 1 Timothy. No, we haven't got there yet. Sorry. 1 Timothy 6, chapter, verses 11 through 14. You man of God, pursue after righteousness. Pursue. Underline that word. Pursue. Pursue after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, that you keep the commandment without stain or reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you are pursuing anything, you go after it, right? If you're pursuing it, you chase it. You give it all you can give. You put the metal to the 
Pedal to the metal is the way you put it. You pursue after it, you go after it, and you don't quit. And you know what? I go to the gym every day, can't you tell? <laughs> no, I don't. I aspire, but I don't get there. I do go often, though, and I have to tell you, right this Beside me, they've got a treadmill. I get on a bike. There's a bike I like. And there's a treadmill up there. And on that treadmill, while I'm working on the bike, you know, after about a half an hour, I want to get off. And I'm starting to feel it. And I look up there at that sign. Every day it says, Don't quit when you're tired. Quit when you're done. I don't care how old you are, folks, today. I don't care how tired you are. I don't care your situation here at the church. Don't quit when you're tired. Quit when you're done. My wife says at 74, she said, when people ask me, they ask me if I'm retired. And she'll answer, she'll say, Dave does the same thing he's always done. He just doesn't get paid for it. Now, I'll tell you what, it's true. If the gospel is worth proclaiming, I'm going to do it till I can't. I'm going to teach Sunday school. I'm going to be involved in the church at whatever level I can be. If I have a chance to preach, whether the rising sun here in the Philippines or over in France, I'm going to do it. It's going to stretch me financially, spiritually, and physically. Ah, but I'm going to do it. Don't quit when you're tired. Quit when you're done. Have you thought about pursuing anything? The boat that I build, the wooden ones, 650 hours on some of those things. I had some men in there the other day just showing them what I do. And they were going, oh, I don't have patience to do that. I'd never do that. I couldn't do that. Yeah, you could. If you're just intentional enough, you could do it. You just have to have a want to. Have you shown intentionality with your faith? Let me say, if you do, I believe you will find contentment. I think you will find salvation. And I think you will find that you will be an encouragement to others. If you do not pursue, I think you'll find the other is true as well. And anything less than that is really just playing games. It might have suggest it's pretty hypocritical. And nobody likes hypocrites. As was read earlier, he used the 10th chapter. Therefore, brothers, sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near. And you've got all these benefits. They touch all these things. You've got a place to meet. You've got transportation and education. You've got so many things. People who play piano are here. People who lead you in other ways. You have a great high priest. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, full assurance of faith, having your heart sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly, unswervingly, hold unswervingly, can be turned. To the hope that we profess 
For he who promised is faithful. Boy. And let us consider. Let us consider. Be intentional. Thinking about it. Let us consider how we may spur. Ah. I don't like people putting spurs, uh, spurs in my ribs. I don't like that too much. That means I'm going to be accountable, right? That means there's going to be somebody that's going to notice that I'm not putting out. Uh, I had a music teacher one time. I had kind of a cold and I was in this choir and uh, I wasn't singing very loud. And uh, right in the middle of rehearsal, the conductor came up to me, poked me in the chest. He says, you're not putting out. I was embarrassed. <laughs> And, and I wasn't. I was pretty much faking it. Sometimes we need to be held to account. Let us consider how we may spur one another on. Doesn't mean you're nasty. <laughs> Doesn't mean any of those kinds of things. Spur one another on towards what? Love and good deeds. Here's a statement that said to Jim, let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. If you have trouble remembering this, it's a great lettuce salad. You guys like lettuce? Uh, one of those might be coming up here before too long. In Hebrews, the 10th chapter, it's a lettuce salad. Let us draw near. Let us uh, hold unswervingly. Let us consider. Let us not give up. Let us encourage one another. Great let us sell it right there. Those four or five things would make all the difference in the community of faith and perhaps beyond in our culture. How old do you have to be to be righteous? Hornblower had to seek maturity and responsibility when he was 14. Josiah started when he was eight and during his teenage years and then throughout his whole life. Let me ask, how about you? How old will you be before you're intentional about your faith? Eight or 80? Let's be like Josiah. Unlike his parents, Let's be that way both personally and in our community. Let's be at a place where the gates swing outward never. An old hymn, just a few more days to be filled with praise and to tell the old, old story. Then when twilight falls and my Savior calls, I shall go to Him in glory. I'll exchange my cross for a starry crown, where the gates swing outward, never. In other words, you're secure there. I'm pretty sure Jim doesn't like his bulls shoving through the gate on the way out. The gates are there to create security. At his feet, I'll lay everything down. And with Jesus, 